Now, as far as uh, documenting a crime scene, and I mentioned before, this is one of the most important things we do is we document our crime scene. And quite simply, the reason is there's going to be a lot of people who could not be at the crime scene who later are going to want to understand the scene. And so how do they do that? You know, you and I get there, we're walking around, we get to see everything, experience it, smell it. Other people who didn't get a chance to do that have to find out about the scene. So instead of us trying to tell people verbally all the time, we have our documentation. So there are three ways we document the crime scene. We have the written forms, that'd be our notes and forms that we fill out. Another way we document is with our sketches. And a third way is with our photographs. All right, the reason we need all three is that each one has strengths and each one has weaknesses. You know, notes and forms, uh, reports that we write, those are really helpful. There are certain things that we write that cannot be shown in our sketches or photographs, such as the temperature in a room, a, a statement, speeds of vehicles. There's a lot of things that don't show up that have to be written down. And, and with the written word also, we can do things, we can write things out in chronological, chronological order, very simple to understand what occurred. Um, but the best taken notes and the best written reports are not a whole lot of help to someone who wants to visualize a crime scene. For that, our photographs are really tremendous. Photographs have a lot of good points to them. Uh, you've probably heard the adage, a photograph overlooks nothing, forgets nothing. Well, that just means as long as whatever you're pointing the camera at, whatever is there that's large enough and distinct enough to be recorded, it's going to be recorded even if we don't notice it initially. Uh, photographs can tell us a lot about the character of a crime scene or the people that live there. Is this a neat as a pin grandma's house with every little tiny knickknack on a shelf and all dusted or is it a hoarder's house? Uh, photographs can um, uh, you know, show us what is blood and what is not by the color perhaps. But even photographs are not perfect. Uh, you may have a cluttered scene like a hoarder's house and it's hard to see detail. But photographs aren't perfect. A lot of times distances are misleading in photographs. But then we have our sketches and sketches are great because it, a lot of times they're drawn as a bird's eye view. You can see everything in one view. So we have to have all three for a major crime scene. So what I want to do is actually jump ahead to photography. All right, crime scene photography. Uh, always use, if you're, when you're taking photographs, always use the designated safe route when moving through the scene. So as we take photographs, we want, and this is one of the first things we do, is take the overview photographs of the scene before we move anything, before we collect any evidence, we've got to get our photographs done. So as we're doing this, we want to make sure that as we move through the scene, we're not going to step on evidence, move anything. We have to be very careful. All right, then uh, when, necess when it's necessary to alter the scene, like putting a placard, that would be our number placard, or uh, a scale, something like that, we're going to take two photographs, one without the marker or scale, and one with. That's so later someone can't claim that we skillfully positioned that placard in a place that blocked the view of something that was actually important uh, because we have a picture without it. Um, and then when using a digital camera, never delete a photograph from the camera or digital media memory. Um, some other just main points, use a sturdy tripod when you need to. You're gonna take complete sets of pictures, including long range or overview photographs. Overall are the larger view photographs that show like the inside of a room where the furniture is and everything. Mid range shots show where evidence is located within a room. So your overview photograph can show here's the corner of one room with a couch. The mid range photograph shows here's the couch with a gun in front of it. And then our close up photograph would be of the gun itself. So we actually have these 
photographs that was taken in three steps, so to speak. Uh, I call it the three-step the three step approach. And then the last point is remove uh, the film or download the digital images and store them in a secure location according to your department regulations. Sketches are a very important part of our job at a major scene. Now, a lot of scenes you will find no need to do a sketch. They'll be simple uh, scenes. But the more complex or more violent the crime might be, and especially on homicide scenes, we're going to have sketches. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we do these sketches, and there's a lot of value to them. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, it's a really great way to see what your crime scene looks like in one glance. With photographs, when you're doing your overview photographs, you'll take four photographs, one from each corner of the room to show the layout of a room. And so someone has to look at four photographs to get an idea of what a room looks like. And it's not all that easy. It's, it's a bit confusing to many people as they look at those. But with a sketch, if you draw it as a bird's eye view, they can just take in the entire uh, crime scene in one glance. You can even make uh, items that are really small show up nicely in a sketch. Maybe they don't show up well in the photograph, but you can put an arrow and a marker of some sort, label things so they're obvious. Uh, I mentioned before with photographs, sometimes you have a hoarder's house or you have a, you know, a lot of stuff scattered about and you take photographs, it's hard to see what is evidence and what's not. Well, on a sketch, you can just draw what is evidence and leave everything else out. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, good things about sketches. And so how do we do sketching? There are different types of sketches. There are what we call projection sketches, perspective sketches, schematics, and detail. A projection sketch is a sketch that usually contains only one viewpoint and depicts objects on one plane. It's usually drawn as a bird's eye view. So you have the overview sketch of the horizontal plane. That's kind of the bird's eye view. That's the most common sketch we do, and it's the most common projection sketch. You can also have a projection sketch that is an elevation. So that would be a sketch that's showing a wall, uh, something of that nature. So it's the vertical plane. So I have an example here somewhere. Uh -huh. So actually, this is a little complicated to use as an example to start with, but I'll do it anyway. Um, this area right here is the bird's eye view of a bathroom. So that is a projection sketch. This would be the horizontal, or excuse me, the vertical view of the wall of that bathroom. Now, so that's a projection sketch also. You can have these two on separate pages or on separate portions of one page, or you can do what you see here and have what's called an exploded view that has the projection sketch of the horizontal plane and then the vertical planes lay down like an explosion happened, and you can see those as well. Now, if you do um, this exploded view, you don't have to do it with all four walls either. It could be that you only have one wall that's important, uh, as well as the overall view straight down. And so you could just go ahead and have just this, this part and this part to show your um, the vertical plane, the wall, one wall, and the horizontal plane of the floor. The projection sketch. The next thing I want to show you is what's called a perspective sketch. Now, this is something that's not used all that much, uh, but it can be very helpful, especially when you're trying to show things about objects. So a perspective sketch contains a vanishing point and depicts objects of evidence as they would appear to the eye with reference to relative distance and depth. An example. So here is a, 
uh, perspective sketch and it's showing we're at an angle. And so there's a vanishing point, things further away get smaller. And it's showing this door opened, broken glass, open, open glove box, blood stain, cartridge cases on the ground. This is done a little more freehand, obviously. And uh, so, the, you know, as far as measurements go, it's really going to be uh, difficult to do that, especially with a vanishing point. So it's, this is what you would end up with on a perspective sketch of this nature. Now, what we can do nowadays instead, and actually we could do this all along, we would do it on, um, on photographic prints that we would print from a negative. But you can take a photograph of this into Photoshop and then put your labeling on it. So as long as it's not all cluttered and you uh, aren't troubled by other things appearing in the photograph, you could actually do this with a photograph. This is, of course, much more simplified in that it just shows the outline of the major parts of the car and then just the evidence. So that could be really what you need. But there are a couple of ways you could do that. So this is a perspective sketch. Then there are schematic sketches, and those are used when you want to show a sequence of events. So you'll have more than one sketch to show some kind of sequence, like bullet trajectory through a crime scene. Those might be used in reconstruction. Uh, some of those can be done in a computer uh, situation. And then there's the detailed sketch. A detailed sketch is a sketch that's used uh, to show a smaller area. So let's say that, um, well, let me go back to one of the examples here. Let's say that on this, in this sketch, there's one smaller area that we want to show in more detail. We can show this as our projection sketch of the horizontal plane and then maybe have over here a second drawing that's a little call out box of sort showing a smaller area in more detail. And it could be a different scale. It could show everything larger. So that would be the idea of a detailed sketch. Most of the time we'll be using the projection sketch. Now, when we do our sketching, we need to have certain equipment available to us. So what kind of equipment would that be? And what I'm talking about right now is out at the scene. So out, out at the scene, you're going to have a clipboard. You're going to have graph paper. You're going to need to take measurements. And so for taking measurements, you're going to need to have tape measures. Now you can get them at different lengths. Uh, the 12 foot length is not gonna be used that much. The problem with the 12 foot length is a lot of rooms have dimensions that are greater than 12 feet. So if you're doing the overall dimensions of a room and you stretch this out, and let's say the room is 20 feet, when you get to 12 feet, you have to stop and say, okay, that's 12 feet, and then start, start over with your tape and continue measuring. And whatever answer you get on the tape now, you add 12 feet to. Just not as efficient. Plus, moving that tape just a little bit is going to give you a full, uh, incorrect reading. So a 25-foot tape is typically what we use. Now, I do keep a 12-foot tape around because um, that could be useful at times when I'm working in a small area, the tape measures a little smaller. And so I do carry one, but often uh, you won't be needing to use something like that. So we have our graph paper, uh, we have our tape measures. Uh, now, sometimes you may need to measure more than uh, 25 feet, especially outdoors, so having a tape wheel, like a 100 foot wheel. And then occasionally you have something even larger to measure and you may have need for a walking wheel. So these though are not as accurate 
but you can cover larger areas. And so this wheel goes up to uh, 999 feet, I guess. And it has inches, feet and inches that read out here. So you're not getting a lot of accuracy. When we do our diagrams, we want to have our measurements to be accurate within a quarter of an inch. So you do have a little fudge factor, but it's only a quarter of an inch. And these only show the inches. So um, in some cases you need, need to use them because you have a very large area. They're used a lot at traffic accident scenes. You see the traffic investigators using them, but that's another thing you may have use of. Uh, you may need to have a ruler if you like to have straight lines. Personally, I don't care about straight lines when I'm drawing my rough sketch at the crime scene. I just make it rough. Um, then, uh, let's see, we have uh, a clipboard. Uh, often you're walking around doing your measurements. So having this all secured with a clipboard is very helpful. An eraser. And then, of course, we uh, will need a compass to help us to find magnetic north. Uh, a flashlight, often when you're do uh, doing your work and recording your numbers and so forth, you're going to need a flashlight to help you get around. Uh, taking uh, measurements. Taking measurements. Uh, even inside a house and you get down in a corner of a room and you're trying to measure where a cartridge case is, it may be kind of dark in that corner. So having a flashlight is always helpful. And then a pencil, of course. Now, often people will use a mechanical uh, pencil. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about it going uh, too dull as you're using it. Now we do use pencil and not pen to do our sketches. So those are the tools generally we need. Oh, by the way, uh, one thing, I don't know if it's on the list, but a GPS. So sometimes we need a GPS in order to even have a starting point. Let's say that you are doing a, um, a crime scene out in the desert. Uh, someone's buried a body or dropped a body off on the side of the road. Uh, if it's on the side of the road, usually you can find uh, mile markers and measure from there. Those are known points. But if you're in the desert, maybe the only reference point you have is a cactus. Well, who knows if that cactus is going to be there a year from now when you need to come back and do something with the crime scene, uh, like show the jury where the scene was. So having a GPS helps. All right. So some considerations regarding our sketching. Uh, we're going to start with a rough sketch and we may do more than one rough sketch in order to complete our process at the scene. Sometimes when we're doing a sketch there may be so much to draw that you want to do one sketch with just the furniture and another sketch with just the evidence uh, or something like that. So you may end up doing more than one sketch, even of one room. Often though, you can get it all on one sketch. Um, the sketch is going to, uh, again, be rough. Uh, you're going to not worry about it being drawn to scale at first. Uh, that's for the final sketch. And so you're gonna start with an outline of the location. You're gonna drop in the objects like furniture and evidence. You're going to do your measurements and record them for all the items that are uh, necessary to measure. And then your, your rough sketch will be the basis for your final sketch. We want to draw that rough sketch before anything is moved or destroyed and after the photographs are taken. So the kind of the, the pattern would be we have our walkthrough, we discuss, we take our overview photographs, then we can start our sketch. And then as we photograph uh, items of evidence, we can then measure them and put them on our sketch. And then as we are ready to collect evidence, we photograph the evidence again, and then we do our collection. So the rough sketch is done before we 
move anything. As I said a little earlier, our measurements should be accurate to within a quarter of an inch. So if I'm measuring and I come up with a sixteenth of an inch, four feet, one sixteenth inch, well, I'm going to write it down as four feet. Um, that is acceptable. Uh, getting a perfect measurement with a tape measure is probably impossible anyway. So we have this tolerance of a quarter inch. It also makes it a little easier for us to draw things. <clears throat> By the way, uh, there is another way to do sketching or diagramming, and that's to use a surveying or a 3D uh, device. That system, you put the device on a tripod and it sends out thousands of laser beams as it scans the entire room or area that you have it set up in. And then it will, as part of that scanning, not only show where everything is, but also measure where everything is. So that is highly accurate. Uh, the downside of those is number one, they're very expensive. They're over $100,000 for one unit. You have to have specialized training and be certified before you can use them. And they are, uh, it's not a simple thing where you just set up, push a button and walk away. Um, it's only line of sight, so you actually have to move it around and do more than one. And each scan can take oh, around 20 minutes. If you run higher resolution, it can take 40 minutes for one scan. So often we will not use those even if we have them. Uh, at a major scene, that's when you probably would bring it out. But in any case, uh, that would be a time your measurements would be far more accurate than we can do with a tape measure. Since we're using a tape measure, we're going to be accurate within a quarter of an inch. We're going to include measurements for the dimensions of rooms, furniture, doors, windows, distances between objects, entrances, exits, bodies. We're going to show details. Uh, including object size. We're going to try to make things look like they're to scale. We're going to take our measurements from fixed location and reference points like walls. So some things to take into consideration when we're doing our sketch. We're going to include as much information as possible in the sketch. Uh, we want to show, and now we're talking about a major scene. So if you have a homicide in a bedroom, you're going to sketch it with all the furniture. You're not going to leave anything out. And not only are you going to sketch it with the furniture, you're going to take measurements of the furniture and measurements to show the exact location of the furniture. So a lot of detail is done with these. <clears throat> do not alter a rough sketch after leaving the crime scene. So you do your rough sketch, it's in pencil, and you leave the scene. You don't mess with that rough sketch from that point on. Now, for some reason, you need to make some kind of change. Then you make a, a photocopy of the sketch and make the changes or additions on the photocopy. And make sure it's labeled in such a way uh, that we know this was done after the rough crime scene sketch and why it was done. If you're doing your sketch and there are things that had been moved prior to your sketching, so let's say you come to a crime scene and the officer says, well, that gun was right next to the, uh, that victim there. And I didn't know if that was a, a good guy or a bad guy. I didn't know if that person was alive or dead. So I moved the gun out of the reach of the body just in case for my safety. Well, okay. You go ahead and you sketch it with the gun where it now is and you make that notation. The gun was moved to this location by officer so-and-so. And then you make sure that officer writes a detailed report. And, uh, and maybe even takes one of your sketches and draws in the approximate location of where the gun was on a different sketch that includes the body. So you have to be really careful that you don't invalidate the entire sketch by claiming you know, by not showing that something's been moved when you did the sketch. Now, once again, scale. Uh, what we're going to do in our drawing, when we get to our final drawing, 
is we're going to draw our sketch at a quarter inch equals a foot. And that's pretty typical. Now that will get you almost any room on one sheet of paper. If you, for some reason, you want to have more than one room and one size of one sheet of paper is not large enough, you could go to an eighth of an inch equals a foot. However, your drawing is, your objects are going to be very small. They're going to be one half the size. And it's going to be a little bit difficult to draw, but it is an option. And then if you are drawing something outdoors that is a larger area still, you're going to have to use even a smaller scale and you would just scale it to work. And as you look at your architect scale, you'll see there are several scales available uh, to do this. Some that are larger, some that are smaller. So a quarter inch equals a foot is what we will usually use, but our sketch, our final drawing, not our rough sketch, but our final drawing, so we're moving to our final drawing, is going to include a title block. So on the drawing, we're going to have a title block, and there are certain things that are required to be there. Case number, the crime type, like homicide or burglary, whatever it is, the victim's name, the na your name, if you're the one who did the sketching, then if you, are the, if you have someone help you do the verifying of measurements, their name goes there. The location, so that would be like the address, and then the date that you complete the sketch. All right, then there's also going to be a legend on the final sketch. You have to show which way is north. Now, you want your north to be at the top of the page. Identification in your legend, you're also going to have the identification uh, labels that you used or symbols. Uh, the scale that you used, quarter inch equals a foot usually. And then a notation that says, not drawn to scale. Now we try to make it to scale, but realizing our measurements are never gonna be perfect, and even our lines on the finished drawing are not gonna be exact, we always put not drawn to scale, though we try to make it as close as possible. All right, so now we want to create a projection sketch. So how do we go about doing that? Well, I kind of talked about it, here is somebody's rough draft or rough sketch. They have gone and drawn an outline of the room. Now I bet you that room did not have rounded walls at the corners and didn't slope this way. But who cares? This is the rough draft. We're just gonna, I like graph paper because I can make the lines somewhat straight, but I don't really care. And then you see here's a door drawn in. Um, I don't see any windows. That's a problem with this. But you see the overall dimensions of the room. Uh, it's 26 feet long, it's 19 feet 10 inches wide. And then you see measurements for different things. Now, these little doohickeys here, that's sometimes people will put those in to show positions that the camera was at when photographs were taken. Don't bother because now with digital photography, people take far too many pictures anyway you'd have your whole sketch filled with these little doohickeys. Uh, just take your pictures. And then down here, uh, a legend to show what the different letters are supposed to be. So uh, let's go and see what the final sketch would look like. And so here is the final sketch. And that's something you do back at the station. is we're going to determine the point of view shown in the sketch. Is it going to be overhead or now we're doing a projection sketch again, or is it going to be exploded view? Uh, the overhead view shows the floor plan and that's what we use most of the time. All right. The, uh, we're going to draw an outline that's, that is generally to scale. We're going to show doors. We're going to show measurements. Uh, we already talked about that last point. Um, we're going to use, we're going to use feet and inches. Do not use only inches. If you measure something and it comes to 77 inches, then when you go to draw with your architect scale, you're going to have to stop and think how many feet are in 77 inches 
72, that's six feet uh, from 77, that's five, so it's six feet, five inches. And now you can draw your line. And I've seen people that have done all their measurements and it's only in inches, and they're with a calculator trying to do their final sketch and it takes forever. So always use feet and inches. It'll save you a lot of trouble. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. It's a good idea to have someone assist you. All right. We're going to take measurements from fixed locations. We're going to be accurate to a quarter inch. And sometimes we need to make a, a vertical measurement if something is not laying on the floor. So if something's on a tabletop, we will want to measure what the tabletop is. When we do our final drawing, we want to make sure that our legend is complete, all the identification symbols are in it. Now, here's a nice thing. Some people have very poor, uh, should I say, penmanship. Uh, maybe you, you had trouble drawing a straight line, you have trouble labeling things. Yes, you have to do the rough sketch, but you could have somebody else do the final sketch, or you could actually do your final in a computer program. Now, one of the things uh, with measurements, I already met, said we're gonna measure where things are and there's dimensions, but let's say we have a body at the crime scene. Well, if you have a body at the crime scene, you're gonna take a bunch of measurements of the body itself. We're, and we're gonna measure where the body is by measuring to the crown of the head, to the wrists, to the ankles, to the belly button or navel. And also, uh, if the body's not laying flat on the ground, the height of those measurements, those portions, those, lo those locations. Now, as far as measuring goes, we have a few choices. Uh, we can use different methods or techniques. There's the rectangular coordinate method. That's what we're probably going to use most of the time, especially if we're indoors. Then there's also a triangulation method, a polar coordinate method, and the transecting baseline coordinate method. I'm going to cover those as quickly as possible. So basically, a rectangular coordinate method is when you measure an object's location from two perpendicular um, walls. So that's usually what we're, we're dealing with. So you measure from the north wall to the object and then the east wall to the same object. And then you will have a definite location where that item is and you can later pl place it on your final sketch with no problem. The, another way is triangulation. Now this is useful if you don't have two perpendicular walls or objects to measure from, but you have two known points. What you then do is measure, like if this is a building or maybe just two reference points in a roadway. A lot of times you have uh, surveying marks uh, that you can measure too, or street lamps that have been surveyed where they are and they're numbered. So you can measure from one to your object and then from another to your object. And then when you draw your diagram, you just take a compass the draftsman type compass or the art compass. You stick the end of the compass there, you make the compass uh, width with your pencil to the right distance and you just swing that around. It'll make a curved line. Put your compass there, adjust it to the right length, swing it around and where the two lines cross is where your object was. Very simple, very effective. Then we have the polar coordinate method. Now this is really a nice thing to have uh, in the back of your mind for one day when you're out in the desert. And you're out in the desert because there's a body buried there and you're going, oh, well, where do we start? Well, in the old days we would say X number of miles from and maybe give a compass direction. And that would be about it for a starting point. But now we have GPS. So let's say that we want to measure where all of our evidence is at an outdoor crime scene. Uh, but we have no reference points. The only thing there is a rock 
which may or may not be there later. So we won't want to use that or a cactus. So what I can do is take my GPS and find out what a certain point is as far as you know the GPS coordinates. And then wherever that is, I put a, a stake in. So let's have a metal stake, uh, a, a large nail, and I drive that into the ground. Now I record what those GPS coordinates are. Then I'm going to go ahead and take a 360 degree protractor and put it right where that point is. So I would use a larger one um, because I don't have a lot of room here. I can't bring in the one I usually use. And it has a hole drilled right where the center is. All right, so that's where my stake goes through. Then I take my compass and I find where north is and I line up the zero to north. Okay, where's north? All right, so I, I align this so it's north along that edge right there. All right, so now I have my point and I know where north is. Then I can take my tape and pull that nail back out, put it through here, through the protractor, and then when I measure something, I could pull it out and go wherever my evidence is. I find out how many feet away from that point my object is or whatever I'm measuring. And then I come back here and I check to see what the angle is. So I write down the angle in degrees, the bearing in degrees, and the distance. And I do that for all my evidence. And then later, it is very simple to make your drawing. When you're all finished, you take off your tape measure, you pull up your stake and pull this out, and you put the nail back in the hole, and you pound it down below the surface of the ground just a little bit. And then you walk away. Then later, if you ever had to, you could actually come back with a metal detector and your GPS and go, OK, should be right around here. And you can find that stake again and then pull it up and then do your measurements all over again if you had to do some more um, reenactment or show the jury something, you could set things up accurately. So that's the polar coordinate method. So here is uh, also a polar coordinate method where they're using this. This is the prolongation of the roadway. So you can always draw straight lines and make a reference point. And then fortunately, this street is exactly at zero degrees. So they just measure the distance and the angle uh, using the polar coordinate method. And then when you draw it, you just use your angles and your scale and you can place everything. Then the transecting baseline coordinate, this is where you just have a line that you develop between two known points and then you measure off of it. So you'd use a tape, uh, like, a, like the 100 foot tape, and you'd start at zero at one point and bring it out. And then you measure off of the tape at a right angle. So you'd note this distance here and this distance and record it. Um, you know, you gotta be careful that you're really straight because if you're at a slight angle, it's going to change the measurement. So if I come here like this, it's going to make the measurement longer than if it was right here. So for accuracy, I don't like it, but maybe there's a reason to use it someday. All right. When we're doing our sketches, we're also going to uh, record our measurements. And this is the sketch measurement page. You, um, I'm going to show you how to use it in just a couple of minutes.